about a player that is moving up fast, and it is driven by NVIDIA, but this one might be even better. On the Rebel's Edge. Bang! Bang. Well, bang. <laughs> it's not a ah. Ain't that the truth? I'll tell you what. It's what? The number one financial book or something right like now, right? Number one business book of 2024. Got to love it. Got to love it. It's awesome. Thanks for joining us, folks. Uh, he is Pete Nigerian over there on that side of the screen. I'm John Nigerian, and we're delighted to welcome you to February 26th, Rebel's Edge. A full week of Rebel's Edge, you know, because we've had a lot of interruptions. Gosh, they love to throw holidays the first two months of the year, Pete. I think we had like three different holidays disrupt uh, the Rebel's Edge, you know, because you have President's Day last week. Um, you had uh, New Year's and then you had uh, uh, Martin Luther King Day. So, yep. you know. Hey, look, not- I'm all in for it, John. I, I feel like a European. We're doing a four day work week. It's actually I now I know why those guys like it so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, Uh, We always start the show with the macro minute, and today is no exception. So we're going to hit the macro minute, and I'm going to say, Pete, that PCE Mm -hmm. is the index that the Fed prefers to track inflation. Uh, And that is coming our way Thursday. So macro, the big picture, that's what matters this week. All right, I'm going to go somewhat tongue-in-cheek, John, but I'm going to go macro with this one. We actually have a Magnificent Seven sighting. Um, And that Magnificent Seven is Berkshire Hathaway. John, have you looked at, (laughs) they had their earnings over the weekend. And I just took a quick look because I hadn't really kept up enough with what that that stock has been doing or whatever. But I I took a look at it. I was looking at the B shares because you can't afford the A shares. John, it started off the year January 2nd, 362. It's now 413. That's a pretty nice run. So my my guess is that that's got to be part of Magnificent Seven. Now, I don't know who you're kicking out because they only want to have seven, but I think Berkshire is now a part of that whole thing. Hell, he owns Apple and all these other stocks anyway, so what the heck? Yeah, and he's that close to a trillion dollars now, Pete. Yeah. He is right there knocking on the door. So uh, I still remember when our old friend Dougie Cass was going against him, Pete, a few years ago at the Berkshire. I think I think Warren just brought him out there to make fun of him. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Doug. <laughs> All yeah. right. Let's talk about Fantastic Future. Fantastic Futures. <laughs> Unreal. Uh, Pete, Fantastic Futures. I could go a whole bunch of ways. I could have gone uh, Bitcoin 53,000. Uh, yeah. Instead, I was kind of focused on the precious metals all going down mm. between 3% for palladium down to maybe half a percent to gold. I mean, but they're all down and heading lower throughout the session. All right. Well, I'm going to give you one that's not going down. It hasn't gone down for over a year. And almost every single day of the year last year coming into this year, unbelievable year to date, I got something, John, that's up 54%. And in the last month, and in the last month, cocoa is what it is. And cocoa is up 39%. NVIDIA is only up 28% in the last month, John. It's outdoing another Magnificent Seven. So we might have to change this whole thing around. (laughs) But it is amazing, and and there's a lot of different reasons for it. Obviously, a lot of it has to do with supply and that whole thing from the farming side of things, as well as incredible demand. And you and I have talked about demand before. It's not just about chocolate. It's about medicines. So there's a lot to go into this whole thing. But... Take a look at a one-year chart of cocoa at some point. It's unbelievable. The run that this thing has made to the upside is just unreal. And, okay, year-to-date, NVIDIA does have them. They're up 60%. Cocoa's up 54%. But that's just barely. The last month, it's sort of flipped around again. Yeah, and uh, one of the reasons we do this with the CME, these fantastic futures folks, is Some people want to concentrate just on stocks, and that's okay, like Pete says, but there are plenty of futures, and you get a lot of leverage with futures, folks. Um, Again, it's just like options. You want to understand what that leverage means for your investments, 
and how fast you can lose, not just how fast you can make money. Um, but my gosh, Pete, uh, these futures, the way they move around from natural gas to crude oil to cocoa, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty much you'd be leaving half of the returns on the sideline if you right. never looked at any of these futures, including Bitcoin futures. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, top of the show, we teased in, Pete, with uh, uh, an NVIDIA play. Well, that NVIDIA play is Micron Technology. Pete used to be the specialist for this one, folks. And today they announced that they'd become, uh, begun rather, volume production of their high bandwidth memory, that's HBM. You'll start hearing that a lot, folks. Um, they're going to start shipping in the second calendar quarter of this year. And what are these? Well, these basically will, will run at 9.2 gigabits per second, Pete. That's one of the fastest chips on earth. And memory is what Micron has always been all about. So GPUs, gra graphic processing units, you know, for instance, that NVIDIA is famous for, great. But what do you also need? Memory. And these guys are the king, at least in my book, Pete. And you said 1.21 gigawatts? No, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing, John. <laughs> Back to the future, guys, just so you know. Performance, efficiency, all of that. And this is something that you and I talked about, John, here not that terribly long ago, probably within the last two months. But everybody was talking AI, and they get so focused on one or two names. And you take a look over at Micron. It's inexpensive. It's got all the things that Micron has always been. But to your point, what they do and how they do it is, is creating the efficiencies that the AI world needs and some of the extra boost that they need because – of what they're doing to get that to that next level. So it's a it's a really nice run. The stock is up well over 5% today. Volumes are absolutely outstanding because people are finally realizing, hey, uh, we thought that this is just a memory company and they were about ready to go bye-bye like the Dodo Bird. That's not the case. This is a company that's doing extremely well. And this relationship that they're going to have with the AI space, specifically NVIDIA, is going to be something huge, I think, in the future. And we had some unusual options in there as well today, John. Bang. Yes, we did. And folks, you look at the market, and the market is screaming higher. I mean, I've got the S&P 500 15% year-to-date. We're not even through two months yet, folks. So you might say, well, that's pretty outstanding. Well, Mike runs up 43% year-to-date. <laughs> not <laughs> so, so bad. You want something that's 3x, the uh, S&P 500, eh, you might want to take a better look at Micron. By the way, 1.2 terabytes per second of memory bandwidth, Pete, and these guys 30% less power consumption. Right. So yeah. faster and less power consumption, you're running some big data center or whatever. Tell me you don't have to have these chips as right. part of that uh, plug-in. Sure. Yep. All right. Well, then we've got Lee Automotive, Pete. Now, it's Chinese EV maker, but you know how we know it's not a U.S. EV maker, including Tesla, Pete? Because they're <laughs> killing it. <laughs> That's how you know. I mean, every EV play in America and most of them in Europe are getting thrashed. And maybe they've bottomed out and like Tesla has, you know, in the 170s, it's seemingly bottomed out. and It's heading towards 200 again. Well, this one, Pete... Um, rallying over 8%. They delivered 131,000 vehicles in Q4. That was up 184% year over year. That's a pretty phenomenal amount, Pete. <laughs> That's killer. How about the revenue growth, John, on top of that? It's up 136% year over year, 20% quarter over quarter. Margins are up to 23%. They were 20% a year ago. So, there is not a, a category that you're looking at that, that's not something that really just stands out in an amazing way. How about this one, too? Free cash flow, John, for Lee. $30.5 billion. I think these guys have kind of figured out how to do the deliveries the right way, how to grow with that, and do it in a profitable way. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. That is a that, that's a balance sheet like I have not seen in a really, really long time, especially considering what they are and what industry they're in. This is pretty incredible. And this is a name that I'm the first to admit, I, I didn't pay enough attention to it. I will now because certainly these guys are killing it and I don't think they're done killing it. I think 
the quarter after quarter after quarter, this is a company that, that probably should do very, very well, I think, over the next year or two. They're not Rivian. They're not uh, uh, Lucid. They're not Tesla. But as far as a cheap EV that mm -hmm. is hitting those kind of six-figure delivery numbers, Pete, sure. there ain't anybody else but Tesla that's in that category. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's talk about Domino's Pizza. Now, uh, we joke a lot about, well, this is their Super Bowl, referring to various uh, uh, companies. And if you're a retailer, when is your Super Bowl? Black Friday. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes all the way into Christmas, of course. Well, uh, guess who really benefits from the Super Bowl also, Pete? That would be <laughs> Domino's Pizza, for that matter, every pizza maker, because mm -hmm. I think all of them, this is their record day of deliveries. But it's not just that. They basically had grown at just shy of 3%, Pete, um, domestic same-store sales. And they think globally that they're going to grow at about 7%. Those are phenomenal numbers for a company as big as DPZ is. So thumbs up to them. No wonder they're trading higher today. Really nice move to the upside for the stock, John. It's it, it's incredible what they're able to accomplish. To your point, it's already a massive company, right? It's like a McDonald's, except for obviously pizza. And you're looking at somebody who's actually going to add another 700 stores around the world. So they're just crushing it in every way. How about this? Not only did they crush it on the earnings, John, but when I look at the gross margins, that's up to 38 and change percent versus 36 percent. That's not such a bad number either. Oh, and by the way, they're raising their dividend yield by 25% and a billion dollar buyback. So this is just basically everything going right and doing things the right way. Domino's has done a fantastic job. They've gone everywhere, all the way to gluten-free to, you know, you know, all those different types of crusts that they, they cook for you and everything, John, they're doing what I, you know, what I, I I'm shocked at how well they're doing it because they've been around so long. You'd think they'd get kind of stuck and pigeonholed but they continue to open wider and wider different types of foods that get added to it, not just pizza, but all these other things. This is an incredible company that's just getting better and better and better. Oh, yeah. And uh, my gosh, Pete, uh, you increase the dividend 24 percent, like you saying. Um, you do your buyback. You add a billion dollars to the buyback. I mean, oh, my gosh. Uh, mm -hmm. Why would you not be long DPZ? Right. All right. Let's talk about one more, Pete, Fresh Pet. So this one, absolutely crushing it. Um, stored in early trading today, basically sales up just that much less than 30%, Pete, 29.9% year over year to 215 million during the quarter. Uh, so sales year over year, tw almost 30%. The quarter, they put up $215 million. I mean, this company is hitting it and hitting it hard. Adjusted gross profit was 41% of sales. So, you know, Fresh Pet putting the stuff on the shelves and moving it out, Pete, uh, that's what you want to see a retailer do. And this kind of growth, you don't find that in big mature businesses. But Fresh Pet is certainly putting up some eye-popping numbers. Well, we all love our animals. We all know that. Everybody's into that whole thing. And, and and they want them to be healthy and they do everything that they can to get them to that point, right? I mean, they're part of the family. We all know that. But John, how about the volume gains as well? That was up 25%. So their volume's gone up. That's great. Their profit margin's gone up significantly. Like you were just talking about, their gross profits are at 41%. They were at 33%. That's a big number year over year. How about the earnings? The earnings a year ago, they lost six cents. You know what they did this quarter? They only made 31 cents looking for four cents. That's a good reason why this stock actually hit 112 today, hit a 52-week high. And I wouldn't be shocked, John, now that they're actually showing us that they can figure out ways to make money and put themselves in that position going forward. Uh, I don't think this is going to be their all-time high. It's 52-week highs today. But I think this stock has a lot more runway in front of it to the upside. Absolutely, it does. And it's going to be uh, very interesting because there are big mature companies in this space, Pete. Yep. Um, Fresh Pet is just killing it. And uh, again, against people with established uh, clientele as well as delivery mechanisms and all the rest, brick and mortar stores. Very impressive with uh, what Fresh Pet has managed to do. Yep. All right. 
Let's uh, let Pete take over for uh, Pete's Rebel Sports Zone. What do you got, Pete? Well, first of all, we got to get more of your videos for these sports things, man. I mean, I always I always get a kick out of whatever you ever find. I think it's fun, and I think other people do too. But we're going to jump right into it. The salary cap. How about this salary cap, John? It's up thirteen percent, which it, it ends up being thirty point six million dollars to the <laughs> salary cap this year, twenty twenty four. There's a hell of a lot of teams out there that are pretty excited about seeing that number and that eye-popping number because now it's moved to $255 million per team in terms of spend, which opens up for a lot of them. It gives a little bit of room for some of them. And in, in, in certain cases, like Detroit, suddenly they've got an incredible amount of money, John, because they've got the opportunity now to go out there with they were already under the cap. Now, all of a sudden, with this cap going up $30 million, that has added a little bit more to it. And I, in a minute, maybe we'll talk about somebody who could end up up there. But how about this, too? And this is part of the reason, and this is the biggest part of the reason on why the NFL is doing so well. Playoffs averaged 38.5 million viewers, which breaks every record they've ever had for viewership since they started in 1990, or 1988 when they started looking at that. It was up 9% for the playoffs in from 22 to 23 that was another big number. The seasonal average, John, 17.9 million viewers, up another 7%. Who are the top two teams? I'll throw this one out to you. You probably can guess one of them. Who are the top two most watched teams this year? Well, Kansas City Chiefs. You got it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I would say San Francisco, but the market's not big enough, Pete, so I'm going to say Dallas. You're right. You are right on both. And we all know why the Chiefs <laughs> had that number. It was not just because of Patrick Mahomes and everybody else, the wonderful players that play on that team. But, well, you know, you get the Taylor Swift effect and everything else. And by the way, I was looking it up. It was all season. It wasn't just playoffs. It wasn't just Super Bowl and everything else. The Taylor Swift with the Swifties did bring a lot more women into liking it or at least watching football. I don't know how much they liked it or not. And girls and everything else. So, the NFL is absolutely crushing it, John. And I think these numbers, going from where they were to where they are, 225 million to 255 million, that's going to give a lot of teams a lot more room. And your team, it gets more and more interesting to me all the time because I look at your quarterback and what everybody's talking about and wanting to trade him and this and that and the other. Uh, I don't know, John. There, there could be something done there that's very close to what we saw happen in Houston this past year. And I've said that before, and I'm saying it again, because I think if the Bears do it right, they got number one and number nine. If they do it right and maybe trade down with that number one, they still have a great opportunity to get who they wanted anyway. Keep the daggone quarterback you have. Just let him play like he did in college. Don't try to change him into Peyton Manning, for God's sake. Let the guy play football. I mean, if you wonder why the MVP of the league is the MVP of the league, they let Lamar Jackson play Lamar Jackson football. He runs the ball. He led the team in Baltimore, you know, with rushing. He also is the quarterback. He's throwing the ball all over the place. The guy's pretty amazing, but they let him do it. And that's what I think the Bears are going to have to do. But I don't know. What do you think of this salary cap? Is this unreal or what? Well, like you and I said last week, Pete, um, the Bears throw around nickels like their manhole covers. So for that reason, um, they are likely to um, uh, trade Justin Fields, sadly, because he has oh. a great talent, Pete, and a nice young man, too, Yeah. Um, from the little bit of interaction that I've ever had around him. Mm -hmm. um, great kid, great family. But, um, you know, the Bears, like I say, they can save millions tens of millions of dollars per year because his next contract after this year, Pete, is going to be one of those eye-watering contracts yeah. um, because he's that good. Somebody else will give him that money. Um, and so the Bears, if they just lose him, because if they don't sign him, you know, they'll franchise tag him and then they'll lose him or whatever. Well, Pete, the benefits that the clubs get, Pete is 100% correct about $255 million is the salary cap. That's salary. Now, they can also do, um, what do they call it, Pete? Uh, Performance-based. That's yeah. it. Performance-based yeah. pay. So, in other words, when they say that, oh, if you get us to the Super Bowl, we'll give you another $2 million bucks or whatever. Mm -hmm. Take a wild guess, Pete. I don't know if you knew this one or not. Maybe you do. 
Do you know how much that is per team now? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I really don't. Four million dollars. <laughs> so effectively, you know, if you're the GM of a team, folks, you could say, I got a 255 million salary cap. Salary means, of course, you have to pay that. Mm -hmm. um, assuming the players on the roster for the entire year, you have to pay them, you know, some part of his percentage of that. But you have another 74 million that could be incentive or performance based pay. So mm -hmm. you could have a guy like Justin Fields, Pete, and you could say, you know what? We're going to pay you 10 million if you can get us to the NFC championship game. We're going to give you another 20 mil if yeah. uh, you get us to the Super Bowl. You've only spent 30 of your 74 million on performance pay. Yeah. I'm not saying the Bears are going to do it because, again, they throw around nickels like manhole covers. But that's an interesting factoid that I thought yeah. I'd share with all the viewers. Yeah, I think that's a great one, John. And and I knew that they had that in there. I didn't know what the number was, though. Oh my yeah. gosh, that's that's uh, it went up along with the cap, of course. Yeah, that's that is eye popping. All right, so the next thing we wanted to touch was okay. Let's just talk about a couple of free agents and where you think they might end up. We'll just do it kind of quick. But quarterback Kirk Cousins. I'm going to say two spots: Atlanta or Pittsburgh. What do you think? Well. <laughs> I know, Pete, that there's a big thing going around on the Internet saying the 49ers. And they're saying, really? let, let Purdy um, learn under this guy. Purdy, doesn't need, to learn. Purdy yeah. doesn't need to learn it under anybody. His first year, yes. This year, he was right up there in the running for MVP, so he doesn't need to learn under anybody. No. So I agree with you. And I would throw New England into that conversation, Pete. I'd say Pittsburgh, New England, Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. New England, the only thing is, I think New England really likes where they are in the draft and who they probably are eyeing up. And, it, you know, a lot of people think it's Jalen Daniels or whatever. We'll see how that goes. How about wide receiver? I'll give you – I think these two guys – I think there's two of the best uh, receivers that are going to be in the free agency are both going to most likely get the franchise tag anyway. So um, – Unless you say differently, what do you think about Mike Evans from the Buccaneers? He's only a six foot five, two hundred and thirty pound wide receiver who every year goes for about a thousand yards. John, the guy's pretty incredible. He's had a great year uh, career in, in Tampa, and T. Higgins, who's the younger guy, who's still an amazing uh, receiver for sure. Any thoughts on on either of those guys? Do you think that I think they franchise tag him, but? If they don't, where do you think somebody like that ends up? I mean, I think there's a lot of teams out there that would like either of these two guys. Yeah, well, Evans, Pete, uh, clearly if the if Kansas City is playing for a three-peat and as long as they have uh, Mahomes, they should be, yeah. um, I get Evans yeah. and I pay him um, because that guy's got the size and the hands and, and you know, the stats that mm -hmm. show he's not just – um, a fast big man. Um, he is like Metcalf, Pete. He's a fast big man that has great awareness of where he is on the field yeah. and can turn and catch the ball in a moment's notice to the inside or to the outside or whatever. So I like him. And I think you put Evans on Kansas City, everybody else in the league throws up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Throws I think you're right. Up. Just yeah. Like, oh. Yeah. Because what are they going to do? You got the tight end with Kelsey, who's about the same size. So what, what are you going to do? All right. How about this one, John? Uh, Derek Henry. Now, this guy is a, a freak show. He's athletic as all get out. I know he's getting a little bit older. But if, if you're a team that's close and you've got a decent quarterback, but he needs a little extra time because maybe the old line's not great, Derek Henry's probably a good guy to get because he's going to scare the defense that he's going to get the ball. But is there any team out there that you uh, you perceive would maybe want to pay him some money, you know, pretty pretty damn good money probably, to go to? I'm going to tell you the Ravens was, was the choice I had. And the only reason I say that, the Ravens got all these running backs, and yet they don't have anybody. <laughs> I mean, it ends up being Lamar Jackson. And I don't think, you know, I think Lamar even would say, you know, I'd like to be able to give the ball to somebody else who can get six yards. <laughs> And that's what Derrick Henry does. So that's why I think he's kind of a missing piece over there because they've got good running backs, but they haven't really performed the way I think Derrick Henry could be the guy. Right. Well, and Pete, he's been in the league now. Um, let's see. He came out in 2015 or 2016, right around there. 
out of Alabama. Um, he is a beast, 6'3", 250, you know, <laughs> and he is a man child. He runs over people. I'll yeah. say another place that needs him, Pete, is Dallas. Yeah. So you yeah. put that guy in the backfield in Dallas, and it's a different deal when you're Pollard or anybody else at Dallas and you're trying to, you know, be the marquee running back. Uh, but this guy is a marquee running back. And the last thing that anybody facing Dak Prescott and the Dallas Cowboy offense with all of their weapons, the last thing they'd want to see is this guy in the backfield. And yep. he'd also last a couple of years longer, Pete, because you don't need to run him every down like Tennessee. Right. Happiest guy in Dallas would be the quarterback. All right, next, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this one out to you, John. Edge rushers, and I'm going to go with, there's a million of them out there right now, and a lot, it seems like all of them are free agents this year. So to try to select any of them individually is very difficult, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> and I'm going to give you Daniil Hunter. And the reason I put him up there as the guy, he fell into the category that you were just talking about, performance pay, John. They didn't want to pay this guy, and I thought it was foolish, and I, and I still think it was foolish. So the only way they could keep him at all was to say, all right, we'll give you some performance pay. We're going to give you a million dollars for every sack you get over a certain number. Well, he had his best year ever for sacks <laughs> and tackles for a loss. So he ended up making $17 million this past year. Not so bad. Still well below some of the other defensive ends that are out there that are great players as well. But nonetheless, at least he got his money. And I think he proved he's not that old yet. He can still play. He's 28, 29 years old. He's still got three, four years left in him. John, I'm going to say he goes to Detroit and the Minnesota Vikings are going to be licking their wounds when they're going to have to play against him twice a year. Because if you got Hutchinson on one side, you got all this money under the salary cap and you put him on the other side and Daniil Hunter is still built like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, he's unbelievable. The guy is in the best shape of any player in the NFL. I don't care who it is. Wide receivers, tight ends. Daniil Hunter really comes in ready to play all the time. He's the, he the fastest guy ever to get to 50 sacks. I mean, he everything he's done, he's done the right way, and he's not gotten appreciated by the Vikings, in my opinion. So what do you think about him? Because Detroit has massive cap space right now. Well, and Pete, what about the other one? What about Marcus Davenport? Yeah, that's another I mean, guy. Injuries was his problem this past year with the Vikings. They signed him to a pretty big contract. He had injuries, and that, that was the, the main issue that they had. But, you know, that's parts of the problems with the Vikings, I think, is they've, they've got a lot of baseball guys in there making baseball decisions for a football team. That's the way I would frame it. Yeah, they're playing money ball with these yeah. guys. And you can't, especially um, because of the injury factor that you mentioned, Pete. I mean, he was a first-round pick when he came out, Pete. Uh, the Saints took him like 12th or 15th or whatever. Um, he is a beast, but he hasn't been able to put together a complete season. Yeah. And that's a problem. But if he did, this guy could be uh, just like Daniil Hunter. He could be that kind of player. 6'6", six, yeah. six, so great leverage, 270, fast as heck. He runs a 4.55, five, five, I think, Pete. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> this is one of those big men that nobody on the outside wants to see, and especially if you've got a situation like San Francisco does where you've got Bosa on one side, you don't want somebody fast on the other side because you don't have enough players to help. Right. Well, and the last thing I'll leave you with is this. The combine begins today. <laughs> so the paper champions and some of the real guys are going to be out there showing what they can do because there's going to be more guys running four three forties than we've ever seen before. The problem for some of those guys is they never showed it on the field. And, and hopefully yeah. these general managers actually realize, you know, the film doesn't lie. <laughs> we know what the stopwatch says, but the film doesn't lie. And some of these guys are going to get boosted up because they're going to have a great bench press, a great 40 time. Maybe it's the cone drill, whatever it is. And then suddenly some guy's going to be a fifth rounder is suddenly moved into the first round and all these guys fall in love with them, which is always interesting, but that's part of the beauty of the combine too, John. Yeah. Well, like you said last week, Pete, I saw a bunch of the HBCU players, Mm -hmm. um fantastic athletes obviously um 
And we're talking about the same athletes, Pete, but just yeah. for one reason or another, didn't get recruited or chose not to attend the big schools and instead mm-hmm. went to a historically black college or university. Mm-hmm. Nothing against that. But, and this is a big but, there's a reason physically a lot of them didn't go. I saw a kid run a 435, Pete, but he's a 168 pound D back. Yeah. That defensive back is just <laughs> going to get steamrolled. He doesn't want Derrick Henry, Henry running the football his way, John. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, you know, do you just run the other way? Yeah. You got one guy, 6'3, 250, the other guy, 168 pounds. He might be able to jump. He might be 4'3, Pete. But if he gets hit, he's done. Yeah. So there's a reason that, you know, speed does kill and you can't coach speed and all the other things we can say about fast players, but it ain't just speed. Mm -hmm. And that kid, I mean him, don't no disrespect. And I didn't even use his name, but I don't think that kid can really play in the NFL at that size. That's pretty small pounds or he is done. That's that small is very dangerous. I can tell you. I mean, uh, you, you see it all the time, and and there's a reason why these guys do tend to be a little bit bigger than normal people, <laughs> because because there's some running backs. Hell, there's some quarterbacks out there. You who wants to get in front of Josh Allen running at you at about a four five five at six five two fifty? I mean, you yeah. know, let's be honest. It's, yeah, there's it's a lot amazing. of linebackers that don't want any of that. You're right. <laughs> Folks, uh, again, he is Pete Nigerian. I'm John Nigerian. We're here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, which means we'll be back tomorrow at 1 p.m. See you then. 